Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us again today. Hi, Lindsay. How are you? Hi, I'm great. How are you? Good. We are so excited to have all of you here today, especially because, well, today is an Earth Day, tomorrow is. And so I guess we can sort of call this Earth Week, maybe. Um, but I guess here at O-Search, every day is kind of uh, Earth Day since all of our work is so closely related to the ocean and just making sure that our planet is a better place uh, that we can make sure is healthy for future generations. So that makes this week and this presentation especially um, exciting. Uh, joining us, my name is John. I am O-Search's uh, communications manager. Joining me today is our education ambassador, Lindsay Loffner. She has been an education ambassador since what, 2015? That's right. And you've been on plenty of expeditions. She's down our, She's been down there on the platform with us and everything. So she definitely knows what she's talking about. Um, Lindsay, do you want to give people a quick uh, introduction to what your uh, class is about today? Sure, absolutely. Hello, everyone. We're so excited that you're joining us here today. We are going to be talking about Earth Day today because, like John said, even though Earth Day is tomorrow, we like to celebrate Earth Day every day. And Earth Day's goals and missions are definitely a part of what OSEARCH does. So today you're going to get to hear about a little bit about the history of Earth Day. You're going to get to find out how you can help take action to help the planet. You're going to learn about how OSEARCH is tied to ocean health and researching about apex predators to help the health of the ocean for Earth Day. And then we're going to do a really cool activity that you can do at home. It might say classroom on the worksheet, but you can definitely do this wherever you are. So it's a scavenger hunt about reducing, reusing, and recycling. So that'll be great. So just so everybody knows, um, the course material for today's class is uh, available for download right above the video player. There's a little button um, to download. Also, there's a comment section right below the video. So if you guys have any questions, um, certainly let us know. Um, I will be monitoring the, um, the messages as the presentation goes. And if uh, I need to interrupt Lindsay to ask something right away. I will do that. Otherwise, I'll try and save questions towards the end. The more on topic your question is, the better chance uh, we'll have of actually being able to answer it right here. Um, but just so everybody knows, I am um, John Osirich, comms manager down in the um, down in the comment section. So if you see that, that's me responding to some of the questions. So with that, Lindsay, I think I will uh, turn it over to you. All right. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Okay, everybody, so today we're going to talk about first the history of Earth, Earth Day because Earth Day has a special anniversary this year. Tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, which is how I had the question, I wonder where it all started. So let's learn about that first, okay? So Earth Day was founded in 1970. There was a junior senator in Wisconsin who had taken a trip out to Santa Barbara, California, and he saw witnessed an oil spill. And he saw the impact that it had on the environment and how the, there would be birds that would have oil in their feathers. Or you might see fish that would have difficulty breathing because oil can get into their gills. And so the effects on the environment uh, on the oil spill really uh, enlightened him about what was happening and he wondered if there were other issues going on in the planet and then he started talking to other people and he realized that not everybody knew that there were things going on that there was pollution in the air and the waterways were being polluted and we didn't understand what consequences that we were having on the environment yet so he decided to start to recruit some people and talk about uh the earth and it's in and how important it is to have a healthy planet, healthy air and healthy waterways and what some of the things that we were doing 
as as the human race that was impacting those things or having consequences on those things. So he organized some teach-ins. He had some people get together around the country. There were about 22 teach-ins, I believe. And he invited everybody. He said, it reminds me of something that our founder and expedition leader, Chris Fisher, would say, let's get everybody together and learn about this and hear what's going on so we can take action to help the planet. And that resulted in Earth Day. And that education part is a, a central part of what OSEARCH does. And we'll talk about how that's all to, tied together in a second. But that education led to action. We had some policies that came out of that. We now have the Environmental Protection Agency. We have the Nas National Environmental Education Act which says that part of our education system needs to be sharing with students just like you what's going on on the earth and how we can help the planet. And um, the Occupational Safety and Health Act and the Clean Air Act. And then a couple years later, because these pieces of legislation and policies can take time, we had the Clean Water Act that was passed. And then a year after that, there was the Endangered Species Act. So those were all really important in helping to have us take a look at what the health of our planet was looking like. And it helped people to realize that I have consequences for my actions uh, with when it comes to the planet. And now, do you know what's really cool? It is estimated that tomorrow there could be about a billion people that will participate in Earth Day projects and events around the world. And while we can't be together physically, there are things that we can be a part of these projects at home, which is why we're going to do that scavenger hunt activity uh, later on in the presentation. So you get to be a part of Earth Day and you are the future also of this planet. How you talk to people and educate those about what's going on in, with our sharks, what's going on with the ocean, and what you're learning about human impact, which we will talk about shortly. You can help be a part of Earth Day by taking action this way, too. So with that, let's learn about what OSEARCH is doing, which is a part of how they are part of Earth Day every day. So... Look at this beautiful shark. This is a, a white shark. And uh, OSEARCH is gathering data on white sharks. They're apex predators at the top of the food chain, maintaining the hell and balance of the food web underneath it, those second tier predators and third tier predators we've talked about. So by researching about these sharks and the health of these animals as well, in addition to knowing what their role is, uh, we are able to also help uh, assess ocean health because if the shark populations go, the ocean's health goes as well. Now, in regards to that, don't forget, we are losing 275,000 sharks a day. That's about 100 million sharks a year. We'll talk about human, but uh, for now, we, we will just say that the, the health of our sharks is directly tied to the health of the ocean. And we're not just looking at the health of our sharks. We are also doing ocean assessments and ocean research projects as well. OSEARCH went on a research uh, expedition uh, with the expedition Gulf Stream, and they were assessing overall ocean health, looking at marine debris and microplastics, re looking at currents and temperatures and assessing overall ocean health as well. So when we collect data on that, we're now establishing a baseline. Here's where we are with the state of the ocean, and here's where we are with the state of our sharks. And by doing that, as time goes on, our scientists are going to be able to, when they encounter a white shark and are able to do research on it, compare six months, a year, two years from now, they will be able to take that information and compare it to what we have now to see if there's a change in their health and try and figure out why if there is a change. So that is some of the reasons how we at OSEARCH are tied to uh, the ocean and tied to Earth Day because Earth Day is all about 
education and inspiring all of you to uh, take care of this planet. And that's exactly what OSEARCH does. We are educate, inspire, and enable. So we're going to tell you all about how cool the ocean is in a second here. We're going to hopefully inspire you because you've learned about it, uh, to tell others about it and take action. And that enables that action part by being able to have activities and resources to help you all. Hopefully that will enable you to take action and because you are the future and current ocean stewards. So with that, I think that we should do some ocean fun facts. What do you think? Time for some ocean fun facts? All right. In your Earth Day packet, um, you can go to education at osearch.org. You can go to osearch.org, click on programs, then click on education. And in the Earth Day packet, there's a whole packet of activities, even though we're doing one or two of those activities today during our live stream. And one of those activities is about where in the world is the Earth's water? We get to tell you about Earth's water sources. Did you know, here's the fun fact. Did you know that our Earth is covered by 71% water? That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And 96.5% of that water is, what kind of water do you think it is? Salt water, exactly. That is the largest source of water on the planet. So it's very important that we're helping to take care of the health of the ocean, right? If 71% if of the earth is covered in water, 96.5% of it is in the ocean. It's really important to, to research and take care of that water source, right? You also can find earth's water in glaciers. You can find it in water vapor. You can find it in fresh water sources because it's important to also remember that our lakes and our streams are often tied together and those can lead to bays which lead out to the ocean. So no matter where you are, you do have an impact on it. You don't just have to live on the coast in order to help the health of the ocean. So with that, that is one of my fun facts. Oh, I know another one. Did you know that 70%, see another 70%, but 70% of the oxygen that we breathe is oxygen that's produced by phytoplankton in the ocean. Oxygen is a byproduct of phytoplankton. So if I am very thankful for the air that we breathe, and a lot of it is because we have the ocean and the phytoplankton in the ocean to thank for it. So those are some fun facts that maybe you didn't know about before with in regards to the ocean and how it's tied to the overall health of the planet. And you can learn more about the ocean tomorrow with your family uh, because there will be a live stream tomorrow. Stay tuned for that. I really enjoy those Wednesday live streams uh, uh, as well. So the other part of this is not just exactly how the ocean is tied uh, directly to us by the air we breathe. But also, did you know that 80% of the ocean hasn't been mapped or explored? And much of that 80% is the deep ocean. Yeah. So we know more about the surface of Mars than we do about mapping the ocean. So there's a lot left to explore, which means you can be part of those future uh, explorers of the ocean too. Maybe you'll find out something about the deep sea that we never knew about before. I can't wait to hear about that, what you will discover someday. And maybe that day is someday soon. So let's go ahead and we'll go to the next slide. You can see, oh, you see it here now. All right. So I want you to take a look at this picture because every day we all have choices that we make and, and those choices can have consequences. And those consequences sometimes are good and sometimes they're bad. Scientists study how people are impacting the ocean and the planet. And more specifically, our scientists are looking at ocean health and shark health. So since some of the impacts that we make are both positive and negative, what do you think the impact that uh, is being 
have and what impact is being done on the ocean with this picture? What do you see? Well, what I see is a bottle. I see a bottle that's now becoming part of the ecosystem. But if it's made out of plastic, and we'll talk about my microplastics in a bit, it doesn't become one with the ocean. It's not like it decomposes. It actually breaks down into smaller bits over a long period of time. And that can have an effect on the ocean. That uh, impact that we're having would happen to be a negative impact, right? We don't want to put something into the ocean that could end up as part of the food chain. So that real, would be real quick, Lindsay. Yeah. I wanted to let you know, as we're talking about this particular photo here, I don't even know if you know the background of this photo. And I just, based on what you were saying, I wanted to let people know. So this was taken by our photographer, um, Rob Snow, who's taken a lot of the photos you see of sharks, but he also uh, took this photo. And you'll never believe where he took it. This photo was taken over a hundred miles out to sea off the coast. And Whoa. this one was found. So that is actually where this photo was taken. So you think that bottles are made, you know, just kind of there on the shore. This is proof that wherever you are in the ocean, you know, I just wanted to give you that fact. I don't even know. Did you even know that about this photo? I did not know it was that far out at all. No, thank you so much. That is a perfect segue because. Yeah, it, you're right. You think of bottles and having it being close to people, but this was way offshore. We have those gyres too that sweep up the in currents can pick up these pieces of either trash or bottles and things and carry them off into the middle of the ocean uh, all over the world. Not just, we think of the Pacific garbage patch, I think in particular when we think of that, but there's five gyres all over the world. So it's unbelievable, a hundred miles out you said? Yeah, I was a little over that, out in the middle of the Gulf Stream. So anyway, sorry to yeah. interrupt. I just, I wanted to jump in since it felt so on topic with what you were talking about. No, I'm so glad you did. Thank you. That's perfect. Wow. Oh, my goodness. So, see, we are tied to the ocean from shore. Who would have thought that that bottle could end up 100 miles out? Wow. That's um, amazing to me. So that's one impact we're having is plastics. And some of these plastics are single use. That means we use them one time and then uh, we get we get rid of them. We can either reduce, reuse, or recycle them. But a lot of times single use plastics are used one time and single use and then uh, discarded somehow, either in a recycle bin or, or in the trash. So that is an impact that we're having. Oh, uh, another impact is the, the, how we use energy, right? So when I'm in my house, for instance, right now, when I'm staying home, I think about when I leave a room, I'm going to turn off the light. I'm not in that room anymore. I'm not using it. Maybe I should turn off the light. What kind of impact do you think that would make? If I'm saving energy, do you think that's a positive impact or a negative impact? Hmm. I think we're at, that would probably be closer to a positive impact, right? Those, there are things like that that are small that do add up over time. And if we all join together and do it together, we can make a huge wave of change, right? In a positive way. What are some other maybe negative impacts though that the ocean is facing? So we are, we are inspired to want to help make more positive impacts. Well, let's talk about some of those, all right? Well, one of those is ghost gear. Sometimes fishing gear is left behind in the ocean where it can just sit there as a large net or a large um, rope. And as it sits there, it becomes part of the ecosystem and it can start collecting things that you don't want it to, like sharks, like fish and, and other things. So ghost gear is not something that we want to find in the ocean at all. There's also unsustainable fishing practices happening. That's actually one of the impacts that are having on shark populations. And so uh, it's important to know where our where we buy our seafood because we want sustainable fishing. It's, it's an important part of the decision that I make uh, when I choose to eat seafood. Uh, we have ocean acidification, which is a result of our actions as well. We have the climate changing and that the way we use fossil fuels and other things that we're doing can change the climate. 
And so that's an impact that we're having as well. There are contaminants and pollution that are still happening in the ocean. And uh, we talked about microplastics. So these are some of the issues that the ocean is facing, not all of them, but some of them that I thought I'd highlight because we are seeing some of these things impact the sharks that uh, our scientists are studying. All right. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Real quick, before we do, Lindsay, there is a question sure. um, from Luke asking, what's on the bottle? What is on the bottle? You know, that is a great uh, question, Luke. Um, at, at that level of the ocean, I would guess that those are like some zooplankton, uh, some little organisms that are just starting to grow and find a place on the bottle so it can... So they can collect sunlight. That's part of that photosynthesis that we talked about that plants do, you know, on land and um, and how they reproduce uh, and or produce and make oxygen for the planet. So I am I was not there when this photo was taken, so I don't know exactly what's growing on that bottle. But that would be my guess is some little organisms like zooplankton that are attaching itself and trying to make a home there. Yeah, and just so you know, it's it's also floating in a big old um, uh, patch of sargasm too. So it's floating. Oh, there you go. This. But I, I don't think it's. It may be. Yeah, I don't know if it's the sargasm would necessarily grow on the bottle, but it is contained within this big patch of of sargasm. So. All right. So this is where you can see if you take a look at these petri dishes and I'm taking a look with you, you can see three different dishes. The one at the very top, you can see some tiny blue like beads, some small microplastics uh, in that Petri dish. Do you know what a microplastic is? Maybe that's a term you haven't heard before. Let's, let's talk about that. Microplastics are little bits of plastic that are about five millimeters or smaller in size. They're very, very small. Some microplastics come from plastics that have broken down in over time and, and end up in different places. And at one time, some of the plastics that uh, we could find in the ocean also would come from personal care products from micro beads. And we used to have micro beads and things like uh, cosmetics and shampoos, facial scrubs, uh, toothpaste and things like that. But no longer because there was an act signed, I think it was in 2015 that said that we can no longer in the United States have micro beads in our personal care products, which is really great. That will definitely help uh, with the health of the ocean. But if you notice how small they are, you can now see if the if the sharks aren't ingesting them directly, that those tiny pieces can be eaten or ingested by just about anything like small fish, who then are maybe eaten by a larger fish, who then are eaten by our the sharks that our scientists study. So what you have there is like bioaccumulation where it, the shark maybe didn't directly ingest the microplastics, but it, because it became part of the food chain, it is affecting them as well. And they can definitely have an effect on the, the, everything in the ocean's overall health. When you also think of our filter feeding animals in the ocean, uh, such as whale sharks even, or, um, or whales and things like that, microplastics can definitely have an impact on those animals too, because they take in large quantities of water. And if those microplastics are within that water column, they're taking them in along with everything else before they filter it out. And they're so small, they can just be directly ingested. So that's part of the concern with microplastics. Now, John, I think I even remember last week on our live stream on Wednesday, didn't Dr. Harley Newton even mention how there's been microplastics found in the every life stage of shark that she's studied too? Yeah, so I, I actually didn't know that when she said that. Um, she said they have found microplastics in every single fecal sample that they've taken from a white shark. And so the, there's a question here that this play is very, uh, is right on uh, topic. Uh, Mackenzie right. asks, do the do the fish eat the stuff on the bottle? And the answer is sometimes a little bit yes, but here's what happens. What you're looking at in this graphic 
is if they do eat the stuff on the bottle, they will inevitably get a little bit of this microplastic. So say mm -hmm. it's the little fish in the corner um, in the bottom right of this graphic, those little fish nibble on it, they ingest some plastic, another bigger fish eats that bigger fish and so so on and so forth on up the food chain. Because what we're actually looking at here right now is um, samples taken from that same batch of, or not that same, it's as actually a different, um, I, I believe, patch of sargasm floating out in the Gulf Stream. Mm -hmm. so scientists took this sample of sargasm and they broke it down into all the different elements. You see some of the sargasm on the bottom left there. Inside it, they found those little microplastic bits. And on the bottom right are the fish that are eating, you know, the sargasm. So mm -hmm. munching on that sargasm, they're also munching on the little bits of plastic, just as if, uh, you know, the, the fish are munching on the stuff on the bottle. So um, just like Lindsay said, it's called bioaccumulation when these little pieces work their way up the food chain by getting eaten by the bigger and the bigger and the bigger animal to the point where you get to white sharks who are at the very top. And then we're seeing plastic samples in every single fecal sample. So, I mean, this, yeah. every time I look at this image, it's like, it's pretty crazy to me. No, I, I agree. And it's amazing if any of you have been to the beach and seen a patch of sarga sargasm wash up, you can tell exactly what we're saying. There's all kinds of stuff that can get wrapped into it. You can have little fibers, um, some fishing line, all kinds of things gets wrapped up in there. But usually that's a habitat for these small fishes, like John said, or if they are also serve as a mat for uh, tiny loggerhead hatchling sea turtles, too. So it's it's impacting these microplastics can work their way about anywhere. And actually, too, I believe that you can find microplastics in every layer that I know of in the ocean too. It makes its way down to the deep sea as well. We're finding plastic. So um, it's not just on the surface too. Whereas I hear some people, some students will say, Mrs. Walker, can't we just scoop it up off the surface? Well, once it's broken down to that size, sometimes it also just makes its way all the way down to the bottom of the ocean too. And so it's not enough to just scoop it off the top. So uh, our, our actions have consequences, as you can see, this picture kind of shows that, right? So now that we have an idea of what impact that we're having and the issues that the ocean is facing, let's talk about the hope in this, the, the positive things that we can do to help take action to help the ocean so it's in a better state moving on in the future, all right? Let's talk about that next. Here it is. This is the lovely MV Osearch. And uh, I absolutely love uh, the ship and everybody on it. And it's so nice to see it there in front of, I believe that's Lunenburg, uh, where I was with you all last fall. But this slide shows some different ways that we can take action no matter where we are to have a positive impact on the ocean and the planet. You ready? Let's start with reduce. What can we reduce? Let's think about that for a second. Well, I could probably reduce, like we talked about before, the amount of energy that I use by turning off uh, lights when I'm not in that room anymore. Maybe I can unplug things from the electrical outlet when I'm not uh, charging something or using an electrical uh, something that uses electricity, right? What else? I could reduce the number of trips since I drive. Um, being older, I can drive, so I should probably reduce the number of trips that I take. Um, when we're back out and able to do a bit more, I will think about taking fewer trips uh, places, too, to reduce my impact. Um, before I would take public transportation too, I would take the Metro to go to Washington, DC. I'm in Gaithersburg, Maryland, uh, right now talking to you. And so we have a great public transportation system. So I used to be able to take that too and try and help reduce the amount of, uh, gas that I was using in my car. Um, you can reduce the amount of single use plastic that you use too. And there are some really cool ways that you can do that. Are you ready? I brought some with me today. All right, let me get out my bag. This is one of the things that I can do to reuse my reduce my use of single-use plastic. This is a reusable bag. 
I have some of these that I can take to the grocery store when I go. And um, it really helps cut down on, instead of using plastic bags, I can use reusable bags. Here in Maryland, we actually even have a tax on how many uh, plastic bags do we, that we use. So it's an incentive to not use the plastic bags, which I think, uh, I hope is helping. However, if you do need to use uh, those bags, and I understand if you do, of course, there has been a cleanup that was done locally in the Potomac River, a major river going out of D.C. and into the Chesapeake Bay, which directly leads to the ocean. Uh, they picked up 16,000 plastic bags out of the Potomac in one cleanup a few years ago. So just think about when you're done using that bag, could you reuse it? You probably could, even though it's plastic, don't make it single use, use it again. Um, and or how are you going to get rid of it? Um, really looking at managing where our waste goes is very important. So that's reusable bags. That's something we can do. We can also reduce our use of single use plastic by using Reusable water bottle. This is uh, my Yeti water bottle that I like to take with me wherever I go. And it has some, you can personalize it with some fun shark stickers uh, or whatever that you are interested in. So that's a way we can use reusable bottles. Or I also saw that our friends at Costa Del Mar have these awesome turvies. And this is an O Search one. So I love that I can take this when I don't need to keep it cold. I can go ahead and use this and throw some ice in it and you reuse my cup this way. So that's reusable cups and reusable bags. And last but definitely not least, what else do I have in here? Straws. So right now I've seen some really great progress with straws. There are some paper straws out there that would be great for you to be able to use. And there are some plant-based straws that I've seen in different places around town. You also could use a reusable straw. And this is a reusable straw uh, that I have and um, you can find them just about anywhere. And that's another way that you can reduce our use of single use plastic. So that's really cool. So that's reduce and it's actually kind of reuse, right? What can reuse? How can we reuse it again? Maybe it looks different and has a different purpose than it did before, uh, but how can we, we reuse it again? That's another uh, thing to think about too when you're trying to replace some of those single uh, use uh, things that we use. Um, and then recycle. Now, recycling is really great. And some things to consider when we recycle is what can be recycled? Here where I live, we have a nice big blue bin. That's my recycle bin. And I can put cardboard in there. I can put paper products in there, but it needs to be clean when I put it in there. So that's how I recycle my paper products. It goes in a separate bin and uh, that's where it goes. Paper, cardboard, uh, things like that. And then I have a separate bin that I'm supposed to use and I do use that is for bottles and cans and things like that. So if I, if you already have a soda can, right? Or a pop can, uh, depending on where you live, you can take those cans and put them into the, the separate container and recycle those. Aluminum cans, glass bottles, plastic bottles, they can be put in that recycle bin. And then I can um, really help the health of the planet by making sure they get uh, reused in some other way because they've been recycled. So that's one way to help. This next one is one of my favorite things to talk about because it reminds me of the place in that picture. Literalist lunch. Are you ready to join me for a literalist lunch challenge, I like to call it? The literalist lunch I learned about through Green Schools Nova Scotia. Uh, they are some wonderful people with some great ideas about how to reduce our impact on the environment and uh, how to have uh, reduce our use of energy. And uh, the Literalist Lunch Challenges was one of theirs that inspired me to write the challenge part of the Literalist Lunch Challenge. And what it is, is we take a look at whatever we want to have for lunch. You can either do it for a day or you can do it for a week. 
But I think you'll notice something, even if you do it for one day, I think we should look at what we have for lunch, what it's packaged in. Because believe it or not, when we have 8 million, I believe, um, tons of trash that end up in the ocean every year, one of the uh, major components of that is wrappers, believe it or not. Wrappers are part of what make up that trash. And those wrappers can come from chip bags, maybe a juice box or juice pouch uh, in your lunch. Um, maybe it's a Ziploc bag. Maybe it's, um, let's think about what other things we put in our lunch that come in wrappers. Maybe, um, maybe it comes in like a package that you have for uh, cookies or something else, whatever you put in your lunch, take a look at what it's wrapped in and take note because then what the fun part is, at least it is fun for me, is to figure out how I can get rid of as much of that plastic or wrapping as possible if, it, if that wrapping can't be recycled or reused. So some of the ways when our family did this challenge at my house, we were like, oh my goodness, it's time to take a look at what we put our lunches into. So maybe use a really usable lunch bag. That's awesome. Maybe use a paper lunch sack. That's great too. Um, that, but we looked at the container that we put our lunch into. And then we looked at the containers and now we use bento boxes as a way to have a reusable container instead of pouches. But there are also, let me tell you, there's some really cool shark pouches out there that you can put sharks, that you can put snacks in and your sandwiches in that are biodegradable. And I love taking, I don't know about you, but I love taking my uh, sharky lunch oh, what, whenever I need to have a portable lunch with me that ha with those kinds of bags. That's tons of fun for me. So, and it then becomes often a conversation starter. Someone might see you with these really cool bags or boxes and say, hey, that's really neat. Why are you doing that? And you can talk about how you want to have less of an impact because single use plastic is a problem for our ocean, right? So how cool is that? It's education and enabling all at lunchtime, the literalist lunch. I also want to take just a moment and say, uh, that my heart and my thoughts are with all of you in Nova Scotia right now. You have been such an incredible community and family uh, to us at OSEARCH. And um, uh, we are th keeping you in our thoughts after with what you're going through right now. So we hope that we get a chance to, I hope I get a chance to see you all again uh, soon. That would be really great. The next thing we can do is a community cleanup. Now, we're not going to go out into the community right now and do a cleanup, but you can do the cleanup around your house, and we'll tie that to the activity in a minute. Also, you can educate, inspire, and enable. We talked about you can be an educator, too. Just like I talk about what's going on in the ocean, you can talk about it as well. And uh, you can help out with citizen science projects. Did you know you can get involved with uh, sit with science at almost no matter what age you are, sometimes you'll need help with an adult and that's fine too. But you can help take pictures of the clouds in the sky and be part of a citizen science project documenting the clouds uh, for, for an organization studying their patterns. Um, there is uh, an organization out here that does osprey banding. And if you're a certain age, you can go out with an adult and go band ospreys and see about their nesting habits. You can be a part of citizen science projects, and that is a way that you might be able to help and give back to the ocean and the planet. And the last thing is a question, believe it or not. That's something that we can all start to do. We can start asking ourselves the question, where does our blank, fill in the blank, come from, right? Where does my seafood come from? Where do my clothes come from? There are fibers that are ending up in the ocean as well. And it's a result of something called fast fashion. I won't go deep into that topic uh, right now because it's a whole other topic for another day, but I would like to talk to you about it at some point. But uh, some places that make our fabric, it can come undone and those fibers end up 
in the ocean. So where does our clothes come from? Where does our seafood come from? And what is it packaged in? So uh, Brooke Kanani is one of our partners. I love uh, wearing her jewelry because part of uh, her uh, business is making these gorgeous handmade pieces, but then she gives back to organizations like OSER to help enable research and education. But her packaging is very thoughtfully done too. The, the, the clear plastic, it looks like plastic, but it's not. It's a biodegradable uh, cellophane. And her packaging, she was intentional that whenever she ships somebody something that's purchased, it's done uh, in a way that is beneficial to the planet as well, which I think is really awesome. So we can think about who we buy from and what it comes in as part of that, right? So just ask yourself the question, hmm, I wonder where that comes from. Now that we have talked about the ocean and the planet and how awesome Earth Day is, it's time for an activity. Are you ready? I'm definitely ready. Let's do this. So I'm going to look at, there are two different versions, believe it or not. They're both in that same packet. There's one for younger students. Here are my students who are in grades like K through three. And then we have one for older students as well, all right? So we'll talk about the, this first one, the Reduce, Reuse, Recycle Scavenger Hunt, okay? So we're gonna look around our house or just in our room too. You might be surprised you could find it in your room. And you can make a check mark uh, when you found that item or write the name of it, you know, depending on what your age is, maybe you wanna write down the name of what you found in the blanks below. Here we go. Find an item that is made out of paper. Hmm. Oh, I have one right here. Find an item at your at in your area that's made out of plastic, and then think about maybe can I reuse this, reduce this, or recycle this? Hmm. Wonder what that plastic item might be. How would you reuse it even? Maybe you have a really creative way to reuse it. I have also seen some really cool upcycled art projects and we have an activity about doing um, upcycled art on the OSEARCH website as well in our STEM activities. Look at for the recycle container in your classroom, in your school, or maybe you'll spot one when you're around your neighborhood. See if you can find the recyclable container and know what goes inside of it, right? Maybe you find a different item that you didn't think of before that you can reduce, reuse, or recycle, right? And, oh, here it is. We can tie it to the Literous Lunch Challenge. Name something that you can reduce, reuse, or recycle in your lunch. You could also even do it for your breakfast or your dinner. Hmm. I wonder what you're going to find and what you're going to write in, in, in these blanks around us, right? Now, we can take a look at how this activity for older students is just a little bit different. You want to take care to wear some gloves if you're going to go out in the community and follow the, the guidelines that surround you. You can also do it around your home if you would like to stay inside, too. Um, but you're going to take a look at food wrappers, plastic bottles, plastic caps and lids, plastic bags, beverage cans, straw stirrers, cups, utensils, and other things. You will find the number that you have, uh, see maybe how it compares to your other family members or friends instead of your class, and make any notes that you find that, that you think are interesting and need to be noted in the activity, all right? So those are our reduce, reuse, and recycle scavenger hunts for younger kids and older kids. I hope you've been enjoying learning about the ocean and our impacts and how you're going to be able to help uh, the health of the planet today, tomorrow, and well into the future. I look forward to seeing what creative ideas that you come with, come up with too, for how to help uh, solve the problems that are going on in the ocean. In the ocean, because I believe that you're part of the solution as well. So thank you for being a part of that uh, solution and for being a part of O Search. We, you are O Search. We are O Search, and we are so happy uh, that you are part of this community. And with that, I think it might be time for some questions if we have some more. What do you think, John? 
Yeah, uh, one of the questions here, kind of a quick and easy one. Cole wants to know, can you recycle aluminum? Yes, yes, you definitely can. A lot of cans uh, that I see around are aluminum cans and it can be recycled. I've even seen a couple of new companies uh, that are surfacing. They're even doing, instead of water bottles, they're doing a water in, a, in an aluminum can because of how nice and recyclable it is. And aluminum is especially one of those things um, that's important to recycle just because of the amount of resources that it costs to get uh, metals like that out of the earth. Uh, um, yeah. It it's, it's a, has a huge impact on the environment. And since the ocean is such an important part of the earth as a well, whole, obviously an impact on the ocean too, just to get that, uh, those aluminum, the aluminum, the metal out of the earth. Um, so definitely aluminum is a very important thing uh, to recycle on a regular basis. Um, another question here, Lindsay, um, if people know it's damaging the earth, why do they continue to do these things? How are we mm -hmm. others to stop using these things and start using more reusable items? That is an excellent question. Cause you're right. Now that we know we have, there's an awareness about it, why do we continue to do it? Well, one, some people are not aware. So please go ahead and share what you're learning with others because sometimes it really is, a, um, there is not an education or awareness about that there really is an issue. And unfortunately, another part of it is sometimes it's easier for people. Um, I, it's hard for me to understand, but sometimes it's easier for people, they think, to just dis, to get rid of something by just throwing it on the ground tossing it into the ocean um, instead of trying to find a place to manage the trash instead or recycling instead. Um, and that that's unfortunately just part of it too. So well, they don't see the impact that they're having. It is a tough thing and it's an important question to ask. Um, and then there, there's kind of two ways to look at it. There's what we can do as consumers of these, yeah. things, but then we also need to take it upon ourselves to hold um, the companies responsible for creating all of these waste accountable too, because, you know, we don't necessarily have control over the fact that some packaging is way overdone, but we can start, you know, making demands that these, that cert, that these large companies who do have control over the way they package their goods, they ship their goods, um, you know, and a lot of companies, believe it or not, are actually starting to listen to this. They are actually starting mm -hmm. to realize that, you know, sometimes as, as consumers, we don't have a choice other than what's presented to us by these big companies, too. So it's a, it's a two-way street. As consumers, we need to let the, the companies know, hey, this is not acceptable. And the companies are actually starting to realize this. They are starting to um, figure out ways to ship, send, package all of their goods on a more uh, responsible way. So uh, we are not off the hook as consumers and companies right. should not be off the hook either. So it's it's kind of a two way, kind of a two way street. Absolutely. I was really well said. Thank you. That's exactly right. Um, this one's a little bit off topic, but maybe uh, you have a quick answer for it. What is the fastest shark? Ah, I love shark fun facts. We had ocean fun facts, and here's a shark fun fact. The fastest shark in the ocean, I believe, is the short fin mako shark. And I think it can swim up in bursts of speeds like 50 miles an hour. That's really fast. But I think it probably has to have a lot of motivation chasing after something to want to go that fast. Because you have to think about, too, it would expend a lot of energy to do that and to be so it's probably not that fast all the time, but I'm pretty sure the short fin mako shark is the fastest one in the ocean. Also a little bit off topic, and then we'll do, so we'll answer this one quickly and then move on to one more question. Uh, is Megalodon real? Ah, uh, Megalodon. What a cool animal Megalodon was. Megalodon, the shark, was is, is definitely extinct. But it was definitely real. That was a shark. I think it got up to a size of length that it was uh, 60 feet uh, and uh, a very large animal. Uh, and if you think about it, a, an animal that large would need to have prey that it could eat. 
that would also be large, which is some, one of the reasons why we know it's no longer uh, on Earth, too. So, but I do love finding those fossil teeth uh, on the beach, and I look for it here uh, in Maryland uh, when I go to those fossiling places. So we are kind of running up to our timeline, but I will ask you one more question. Are you doing anything special tomorrow for Earth Day? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I am going to go and take a, a walk around my house and then take a walk around outside to see what I can reduce and reuse and recycle. This is, And I'm going to add another thing to our list and, and or donate. So I'm in the process of moving, actually. And when I'm in the process of moving, I have to think about what are we using? What can we reduce? What can we re, uh, recycle or reuse? And then I have to think about maybe I should donate this so this can help somebody else because I'm done using it. So that can be a part of maybe what you're thinking about to help with Earth Day as well. Excellent. What about you? What are you doing, John? Oh, I've got a busy schedule uh, tomorrow because <laughs> like so. every day at Earth, every day at OSearch is kind of um, is kind of Earth Day, but tomorrow is actual Earth Day. Uh, we have a very exciting uh, one that I am personally extremely excited about a live stream tomorrow on um, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Uh, it will be with. Our expedition leader, Chris Fisher, it will be with the founder of Jefferson's Bourbon, our wonderful partner, and then an extremely special guest, uh, Dr. David Gallo, who is an oceanographer uh, and best known for exploring the Titanic wreck. Um, and so we are going to talk all things ocean. And so I'm going to be getting ready for that. And um, I hope that you can all tune in and catch that because it should be really, really exciting. Um, just to wrap things up here, all of our STEM curriculum, if you guys are looking for things to do while you're at home, is available on our website, osearch.org slash education. Find your grade level, find what you're interested in, go ahead and download it. If you ever have any questions, certainly let us know. Uh, you can reach us at education at osearch.org. Um, we'll be there to help answer any of your questions that you have. Keep an eye out for more uh, virtual classrooms that just like this. Uh, we'll be doing them for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we'll be announcing them via email and our social media channels. Um, so just stay tuned for all of those. Uh, we really appreciate it and enjoyed having you all today. Um, and so I guess happy Earth Day and we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone.